<laughs> I thought you might like that one. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> How does it feel to be part of the church? <laughs> Amen. So we're, we're looking today at uh, resurrection. And um, let me see if I can find a place for you to turn in the Bible. Okay. Yeah, we'd like to go to John 20, please. I'm reading um, from the Amplified Version of the Bible. At the end of this service, about the last, what, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, the children and the youth are coming back to minister to us. So just prepare yourself for that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been removed. She saw the stone had been removed from, lifted out of the groove across the entrance of the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus tenderly loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Upon this, Peter and the other disciples came out and they went towards the tomb. And they came running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and arrived at the tomb first. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not enter. Then Simon Peter came up, following him, and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. But the burial napkin which had been around Jesus' head, was not lying with the other linen cloths, but was still rolled up, wrapped around and around in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in too, and he saw and was convinced and believed. For as yet they did not know, understand the statement of Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, lodging places. But Mary remained standing outside the tomb, sobbing. As she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you sobbing? She told them, Because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. On saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know, recognize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying so? For whom are you looking? Supposing that it was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away from here, tell me where you have put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher or master. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Yeah. Okay, verse 18. Away came Mary Magdalene, bringing the disciples' news, word that she had seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. Then on the same day of the week, when it was evening, though the disciples were behind closed doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace to you. So saying, he showed them his hands and his side. And when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy, delight, exhortation, ecstasy, and rapture. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. Just as the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. And having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now having received the Holy Spirit, 
and being led and directed by him, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. Now I want to draw out a few thoughts from, um, from this particular portion of Scripture. The, the, first, the first thought here, that in the resurrection, Jesus actually reveals himself. Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, he revealed himself first to Mary Magdalene. She did not recognize him. And you remember, he revealed himself to the disciples. It's amazing to me that Jesus, in his resurrected form, the first thing that he was really doing was revealing himself. He revealed himself to the two on the Emmaus Road, the two disciples. They didn't recognize him. And when he came amongst the disciples... And he came through the wall, walked through the wall. It's going to be fun to have a resurrected body, isn't it? <laughs> no? <laughs> You're going to have a resurrected body one day. We'll have a look at that if we get time in a moment. But uh, Jesus walked through the wall. And then he said to the disciples, peace. And then he, bre he breathed on them the power of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that Jesus wants to do is to reveal to to us that he is resurrected. He wants to reveal to, to reveal to us that he's alive. And I don't know whether you've ever caught a glimpse of the resurrected Jesus, either through the scriptures or by direct revelation, an open vision, or in some way, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. You saw something. You saw something about the resurrected Christ. I was telling my father about the res risen Jesus. I was telling him about the Jesus that has fire in his eyes in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1. And he said, I don't know that Jesus. That Jesus that uh, described when John, the apostle, the beloved apostle, used to put his head on the breast of Jesus when Jesus was alive. And now John, when he sees the resurrected Jesus, falls down as if one dead. He falls at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus even has to minister to him and said, don't be afraid. It's, I, it's, it's me, John. Don't be afraid. He said, I am he that was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. So revealing the resurrected Christ to us is a key, is very, very important for us to know that Jesus is risen from the dead. It's very, very important for us to see him in his resurrected form. You know, all of the, the journey that we have in Scripture of Jesus coming to the place of resurrection, that was the purpose the purpose of his whole life was to be raised from the dead. The purpose of his whole life was to ascend to heaven and go back to the Father. And in the, comp and, and in the act of ra being raised from the dead, he was achieving certain goals. He was achie achieving certain things. You, but you know, we can ask God to see Jesus Christ in his resurrected form. Lots of people, they worship the cross with Jesus on it. No, no, the, cro the cross is empty. Amen. No, no, the tomb is empty. Amen. You understand now Jesus is living at the right hand of the Father. He's living as a resurrected man. He is alive, the Bible says. He ever lives to make intercession for us. That's why we're still here. That's why we survive. That's why we progress. That's why we make inroads, because he is alive and he is resurrected and he's praying for us. Amen. At the right hand of the Father, ever lives to make intercession for us. The saints 
Oh, my God. I think somebody should say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. When you've been at your lowest, he's praying for you. When you've been in the most distressed situation, he's praying for you. When you've been feeling the worst, he's praying for you because he's, there, he's alive <laughs> and he ever lives to make intercession. You say, well, does he know my situation? Oh, yes, he knows your name. He knows your situation. He knows the hairs upon your head or the lack of. He knows. He knows everything about you. And I'm telling you, because he is risen, because he is powerful, because he is alive, he's not about to abandon you right now. He's not about to turn loose of your life right now just because you're in some kind of situation that seems very, very difficult. Okay, so he is with us. So, Father, we pray that you will reveal the resurrected Jesus to us. The Jesus in the book of Revelation. The Jesus that has eyes of fire. The Jesus Christ that is powerful, that is ascended, that is glorified. We pray, Lord, that we would not be holding on to some religious notion, some religious idea, not even the Jesus on the cross, but we would actually see Jesus risen from the dead. We would see the power of Jesus in our lives. Hallelujah. And the resurrection would become, by revelation, apparent in our thinking, in our daily living, in our experience, in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Just turn to your person next to you and say, he is risen from the dead. Tell them, I know him as a risen Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then Jesus is giving to Mary Magdalene some instruction. It's very, very interesting. First, Jesus reveals himself. And then he said in verse 17, I am ascending. He said, but go tell my brethren that I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now he's revealing the father. Now, he said, he reveals the Father. I am going home to my Father and to your Father. I don't know, you know, when you, when you have the understanding of religion and you have the understanding of, the, of how harsh religion can be and how impersonal. I mean, I've studied out Hinduism and uh, we, we, Joyce's uh, family, you know, his her dad was one time a Hindu before he became a Christian. And I've studied out, and I will ask them about their personal relationship with God. And they, they struggle because they, they don't have a personal relationship. The best you can do is to go and worship an idol <coughs> made of stone or made of something else. It's impersonal. It can't speak to you. And when you're looking at something, you know, in the, in the religious context, and even in Judaism, if you go and see, you know, the Jews praying at the Wailing Wall, and you go and see them, you, you can see them praying. If they've got a quorum of 12 men, they can pray. They pray on the plane. And they can see, they, they pray the same prayers. They have a prayer format. It's something that is not, engaged at all with family. He's not engaged at all with father. He's not engaged with intimacy. It's a religious act. And then when Jesus is speaking to Mary Magdalene, he said, I'm going to go to your father, to my father and to your father. And he was revealing again now the father he said, it's your God and my God. And I believe one of the hallmarks of what Jesus was doing here was to say, I'm going, but the Father will still be looking after you. The Father whose family you belong to, whose name you own, will be looking after you. 
It's incredible to me that God portrayed as a father in a fatherless generation that we live in right now. And if people begin to capture and understand who the father is, they understand the love of the father, they understand the concern of the father, they understand the father always wants the best for his children, always wants his children to succeed. And you begin to enter in, even knowing the Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. His whole purpose was to bring us to the Father. How well do we know the Father? These are the words of Jesus after his resurrection. Hallelujah. First of all, he reveals himself. Now he's revealing the Father. And he wants us to know the Father. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know the Father. How well do you know your Father? How well do you know his comfort? How well do you know his still small voice? How well do you know his loving touch, his intimacy? How well do you know that when he comes, I tell you, he will put your head upon his breast and he will give you understanding and he will give you comfort and reassurance. How well do you know the Father? We need to know the Father in this generation, this generation of wickedness, this generation where there is so much evil, so many things going on. Where do you take it to? Where do you go to with all of that stuff? I'm going to tell you, you can go to the Father and you can share with the Father. You can cry with the Father. You can laugh with the Father. You can receive from the Father exactly what you need by way of endearment, by way of being encouraged, and by way of being affirmed. You can receive from the Father. And let's just pray, Father, I pray, I pray as Jesus said, he's going to his Father and to Mary Magdalene's Father. And one of the things, Lord, that we know that we need to understand in this generation, we need to understand the Father better than ever before. And I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge and grace to be upon us, that our eyes will be opened and unstopped, our ears will be unstopped, that we will know the Father, and I pray that we'll be ministered to by the Father, know Him intimately, know Him directly, know Him, hallelujah, as the one who cares for us. And I pray the anointing will rest upon us and I drive out every orphan spirit, every spirit of insecurity, every spirit that seeks to tell us the opposite to love, every spirit that condemns, every spirit that accuses, I break your power in the name of Jesus Christ and I command you to leave this place, leave every heart, leave every person and I pray every person in this place will have an assurance of your love, Father, that they will know you, that they will know you. You visit them in their nights, you visit them in their dreams, you visit them in their waking moments, you visit them, Father, throughout the day. In the mighty name of Jesus, I decree that we shall know the Father as a church. Amen. We shall know the embrace and the love of our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Pastor, you're preaching no good. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, now we've got this with Mary Magdalene. In verse 18, away came Mary Magdalene, bringing the disciples news, word, that she had seen the Lord. First, she is describing the revelation of seeing the resurrected Jesus. She saw Jesus. Now she is going to actually preach or proclaim what she saw. Mary Magdalene. She was the first to preach and proclaim the resurrection of the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but to me, it's an exciting thing. She's the first one who saw the risen Christ. She experienced him. And now she is going to tell somebody else he is risen. He is not dead. 
He is not in the tomb. Nobody has stolen his body because I saw him. I talked to him and he talked to me. How would you feel if you were one of the disciples and Mary Magdalene came bursting and said, I saw the Lord. (laughs) She's preaching the resurrection. And if we get time, we'll have a look at it. But, you know, what the difference with the preaching of the disciples in the, from the upper room when they came out full of the Holy Spirit. They preached from that moment on the resurrection. They preached what they had seen. They preached what they knew. Yes, they preached the cross. They did preach the cross. They did preach repentance, but they preached the resurrection. Added to their preaching, their former preaching, was now the resurrection. He said they went everywhere and preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Mary was the first one. She was the first one to preach the resurrection to the brethren. She preached what she had seen. She proclaimed what she had seen. I wonder, are we proclaiming the resurrection? Are we telling people that Jesus is alive? Are we telling people and proclaiming to people, hallelujah, Jesus is not dead. Jesus is not in the tomb. Jesus is not on the cross. Jesus is alive and he has power. He's at the right hand of God. And if I pray for you, that you will see the demonstration of the kingdom of God because the Jesus I know is alive. The Jesus I know does miracles. I was um, in Uganda. I may have told you this one before, but I was in Uganda. It's so good to tell. And I was preaching in a village. It was in a rural area. And unlike in many parts of Africa, they just, they, where I go, they just want, they, they come in their hundreds. Sometimes even their thousands, they come to listen. Nobody wanted to listen here in this village. And I couldn't understand. The village was gripped by demons, and, and mainly of alcohol, alcohol demons. And I was preaching on the hill, nobody kind of stopping like normal to listen. So I heard myself say some words, came out of my mouth. I said, I believe in the God of miracles. My God is a God of miracles. I said, I don't know what your God is like, but you can put anybody in front of me right now and God will heal them. When those words came out of my mouth, I went, what did I just say? I was like, whoa, what did I just say? And, and of course they did. They, they put all kinds of people in front of me. Then they had their attention then. Demonstration will work where other things won't. And now I've got their attention. The first uh, person is a boy of about nine. They said he's mentally deranged. He's never been normal since he was born. They did not tell me he was deaf and dumb. They didn't even know. Prayed a very simple prayer for this boy. And the next thing he starts talking to me in perfect English. Muzungu is my friend, he said. He's never spoken any words in his life. Now he's talking to me in perfect English, not pidgin English. And the people came running. Hundreds of people came running down in the village and and began to talk to him and dialogue with him. Why? Because they knew he'd never spoken before. They they knew he'd never heard before. He was deaf, dumb, mute, mentally deranged. Now his, his mind is perfectly normal. Could you be able to say something like that to people you meet? My God is a God of miracles. Jesus is risen from the dead and you preach a resurrection and you say, my God is powerful. My God can do anything. I tell you, you will sense and know the power of God. If you let me pray for you, you will see the miraculous coming in your life. And if somebody's deaf, you know, you just put your fingers in their ear like Jesus did. (laughs) Say, Epirates, be opened in Jesus. Watch the ears open. Seen many, many, many times. And just recently, of course, the, uh, in, in this last season, we've been in five blind people have seen. One in Birmingham and four in Kenya. So now we get to pray for blind eyes. You have this resurrection power inside of you. I have this resurrection power inside of me. But are we proclaiming the resurrection? Are we proclaiming? Would we do it today? Jesus is alive. Or we just do it amongst the Christians. Where it's comfortable. 
And of course, we, it's good amongst Christians too, because they say, he is risen indeed. And we, we have, we, this is our day. This is the day where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the day, but it's, it goes deeper, because the resurrection has profound effect upon us, and profound effect upon the world, to the point where we can actually speak life, where we can demonstrate the kingdom of God, because there are so many people suffering out there. There are so many people under the cosh out there. There are so many sick people, broken-hearted people, people who are struggling to get along. Some people are not making it anymore. And we have the power. We have the proclamation. And we can preach Christ crucified. We can preach Christ risen from the dead, Christ alive. Christ will help you because he loves you. And then demonstrate something. Say, well, that's not my thing. Well, what is your thing? <laughs> well, my thing is, I'm, I'm a bit shy. <laughs> we'll pray for you at the end. Come, receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's give away what we have. Peter and John said, such as I have, give I unto you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Amen. Okay, this is, this is the effects of the resurrection. Now, you bear it in mind, I'm just going on, I've followed through, I've done two things so far. The third one, he said there in verse 19, that on the same day of the week, when it was even, evening, Though the disciples were behind closed door for fear of the Jews. So there's fear. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace to you. Wow. Amazing. The first words Jesus saying there to the disciples. Peace to you. I believe there is something about this. Now, he's gone from talking to Mary Magdalene, he's now talking to the disciples, except for Thomas. He talks to Thomas later. He's talking now to the 11 disciples, and he said the first words he said to them is, peace. And I believe there's something here. From the resurrection, we move from fear to peace. We move from fear to peace. Whatever fear is in our lives, when, when Jesus Christ comes and he says, peace. Peace I, leave un peace I give unto you. Things we're anxious about. This is the power of the resurrection. This is one of the effects of the resurrection. He said to them, peace, and I do not believe for a moment that any one of them in that room was in fear again. The time Jesus was there at least. Let's just pray on that one. And Father, I thank you that the resurrected Jesus Christ ministered first to his disciples peace and right now we receive your peace in any challenges and any situations any things in our lives we now release i release peace i say peace to you peace to your family peace to your heart In the name of Jesus Christ, just breathe it in. Take the peace. One of the things I liked in the Anglican church was the peace. You give peace to one another. Receive the peace. That situation you've been praying for, the Lord tells me, he's going to work it out for you. All is well, and all will be well. Speaking to somebody. In the time of God's favor, he has heard you and answered you. And in the day of salvation, he has helped you. He will preserve you and keep you to be a covenant for the people. 
and I command peace, and I rebuke the spirit of fear, anxiety, worry, trepidation, intimidation is broken in the name of Jesus Christ, and I loose you into the realm of peace. Hallelujah. I'm just going to move on. And um, verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, just as the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. And I call this message the resurrection break out. Resurrection breakthrough, the resurrection break out. And here it is, the resurrection breakthrough that Jesus acquired, that he did. Now comes to the resurrection breakout. He said to the disciples, so I am sending you. So we have Jesus sending the disciples. And then it said to them, and having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. I was amazed because when you come over to Acts chapter 2 and you see them being filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, this experience occurred before that. And he said to them, he gave them the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm sending you, but I'm empowering you to do the job. He gave them the power of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 23, Now having received the Holy Spirit and being led and directed by Him. You see, now they had authority. They were being told, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. I don't know what you make of that. I don't know what you make of that whatsoever. That we could forgive people's sins? I mean, we moved away from the priesthood, didn't we, in the, like in the Roman Catholic Church, etc. You know, the confessional. We said, you know, men doesn't have authority to do that. But it's amazing. You read the Bible there, and it's not, in the, the, it's not the only place it's written. If anybody has offended you, hurt you, spoken evil of you, done bad things to you. If you forgive them, the Bible says they are forgiven. Wow. And it said if you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. This to me is the first word of reconciliation. This is a word that I'm hearing, reconciliation. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We don't walk into situations like bull in china shop. We don't walk in situations and then threaten, you know, like people go in situations, bigger countries, and they say, if you don't do what we tell you, we'll come and sort you with nuclear or whatever, whatever, whatever. We have the ministry of reconciliation. It's amazing to see people who've been so, so abused and so maligned and so damaged, forgiving other people. And they just finished with this one story, and then we're going to pray. But there was, a, there was a video I saw. Some of you may have seen this video. A man by two other men, or three men actually, this was in Malawi, was beaten to death. He was in the church. He came to the church door when he saw them out of the compound and he opened the door and invited them to come in. Right there in front of the church, they beat him to death. He was dead, I think, for about three days. And they had him in the church and they were praying for him to be raised from the dead. It's amazing what happened. He was raised from the dead. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. They went and got him. For, they, they went and prayed in the mortuary. That's right. He was in the mortuary. He was taken there. So they went and prayed in the mortuary. The man was raised from the dead. Did you see this on the video? He was raised from the dead. 
He came out of the mortuary. He went first back to the church, and they had a celebration and rejoiced. You actually see it on, on, the, on this a whole video. And he went back to the church. Then he went down to the police station. They'd caught one man, and they charged him with murder. They, they hadn't found the other two guys. He went down there, and they couldn't believe. The man that they had seen, the police in the mortuary, now they're talking to him, and he's alive. That's pretty hard to get your head around for a start. And then he's telling them, I want you to release this man. They said, we can't do that. We said, well, now there's a resurrection. There's no murder, right? <laughs> he persuaded the police against, you know, a lot of opposition to release the man into his custody. And they released the man to him. And he took the man to the church. <laughs> of course, the man got born again. The man repented. But he forgave the man. He told the man, I forgive you. He told the police, I forgive them. To me, that's incredible. If he'd said, I don't forgive them, he'd have stayed in the prison, at least. Probably been, don't know what Malawi's like, but executed or at least life imprisonment or whatever. The power to forgive. Have you forgiven? My time is gone. Okay, let's, let's just finish by praying. Just to finish by praying. And uh, I want to... I want you to hear the words here. From the resurrection. From the resurrected Christ. I am sending you. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Just take a moment. Close your eyes a moment. There'll be a bit more of this later, but I am sending you. Just make a decision that you will go. Make a decision that you will speak to somebody about the love of God and about the resurrection and the cross of Christ. Just make a decision. I'm sending you. Now, ask for the Holy Spirit's power. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. You will succeed because of my Spirit. And I release the power of the Holy Spirit to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I release the blessing of the Father. Be empowered. Be equipped. Receive wisdom from on high now to be able to answer anyone in any situation, to be able to solve any problem that you are facing. In the name of Jesus, I decree a blessing of wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. Lastly, and as we go into communion now, forgiveness. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And whoever sins you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. There's a lot of authority in that and a lot of power. First you forgive for your own sanity, your own well-being. You never, never will be having that peace and grace and joy if you harbor unforgiveness in your heart. Let's look.